Welcome to Hello Animal Talks. I'm your host, Jenny Worthington, and in this video series, I will be introducing you to people and organizations around the world who are doing extraordinary work for animal welfare. In this first video, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Ari Van Dierwinter, the owner and founder of the Rhino Orphanage in South Africa, dedicated to rescuing and rehabilitating orphaned rhinos. Please enjoy this interview with Ari Van Dierwinter. Okay, so you are the founder of the Rhino Orphanage, which, as I understand it, is the first one in the world. Yes, that's right. Uh, this was the first dedicated rhino orphanage in the world. Uh, it started about eight years ago, and it was never intended to happen. It started by accident. And tell us how that happened. What actually happened was that one morning very early, uh, I got a phone call from one of our next door neighbors, and I could hear that he was really stressed. And he said to me, the shots being fired on his farm and he doesn't know what's going on. Can I please organize the company's helicopter to come and help? So I found the pilot. He picked me up and we flew over there. When we got there, there was a rhino cow shot about 400 meters from his house. And uh, we... While we were flying, we found another cow that was shot with a little baby calf of about three months old that was killed right next to her, which is very strange because they don't usually kill the babies. And uh, we eventually found all these other rhinos. And when we landed, he came up to me and he said to me, uh, the first cow has got a, about a seven-month-old calf, a cow that was shot next to his house. Where can he take it? And I said, I've got no idea, but there must be dozens of places. So we went home, walked into the office, started phoning everybody and every organization that I could find. And everybody said no. And eventually I got through to a specific organization, to this woman that runs their rhino portfolio. And uh, she said to me, they've been having meetings for the past 18 months on where to build a rhino orphanage and who's going to pay for it and what's going to happen. And yeah, I've got a very big mouth. So on the phone, I said to her, no worry, I'll build one. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a, and I put the phone down and I thought to myself, you know, hmm, but what did you do now? And I picked the phone up again and I found a friend of mine who's from England. He's now, in those days, he was in South Africa. A Yorkshireman, and I said to him, Pete, and he's a PR and marketing fundy. So I said to him, Pete, we're going to have to build the world's first rhino orphan. And uh, yeah, and the first thing he did was call a massive press conference. And I said to the world press, we're going to build the world's first rhino orphanage. And we didn't have anything to do it with that because I thought it was going to be easy. And uh, yeah. And it wasn't that easy, but eventually we did it. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, it was, it was really a massive struggle in the beginning. Uh, the first people that I spoke to about this dream of building the world's first rhino orphanage was New Holland Agriculture. And they gave me a tractor, brand new one. I was very thankful for it. I still, the office still got it. We still use it every day. But that's what I had. I had a tractor. And, uh, but I was absolutely 100% sure it's going to be easy. So uh, we started all these campaigns. And to sell a dream is very difficult. Once something is established, it's easy. Well, relatively easy. But to sell a dream is very difficult. And people from Johannesburg organized us a fundraising function. And they said all the rich and famous are going to be there and uh, we're going to make a lot of money. And we came back from that specific function with virtually nothing. And I walked into the house and I said to my wife, you know what, this is not going to happen. This dream is never going to realize. And she said to me, no, no, no. Hang on, 
these guys in the boma which is uh, i don't know if you know what a boma is i do like yeah area where they have uh, functions uh, that is uh, having a dinner and they want me to speak to them about this dream of a rhino wolf. And I said to her, who are they? And she said, she's got no idea. All she knows, they are a lot of guys on a golf tour. I said, oh my gosh, you know, I play golf. I know what people on a golf tour look like at nine o'clock at night. And, uh, but she forced me to go. And I went there and I did my presentation and I said, thank you very much. And turned around to walk out and, the one guy got up in segments from his chair and he looked at me and he said, I am so-and-so, I am the CEO of Pretoria Portland Cement. I'll give you so many bags of cement. And the guy next to him jumped up and said, you're a Mickey Mouse, I'm the CEO of the fire cement, I'll double that. And to cut a long story short, there were 32 guys, all big bosses in the construction industry. And I still get good bumps when I think about it. And I walked out that night with everything to build the whole birth, the whole thing, plumbing, electricity, everything. You could mention it and we got it. So, yeah, and that is how we started. We actually got our first calf in before the orphanage was finished, little black rhino. And uh, he grew up in a little enclosure right next to the house and it was chaos. And, you know, we people had to, my wife looked after him and he had a pro, they actually found him on a massive farm uh, reserve, actually, uh, with uh, rectal prolapse. He was walking in the desert. He was a, he's a Western uh, desert black rhino. And uh, that was chaos. And he ended up in the veterinary hospital in Pretoria at Onastapurt, but he pulled through eventually and uh, yeah that was how it started and it started and eventually the rhino orphanage the building was done and dusted and we walked with this little baby down to because he followed the carer and we walked with him down to the orphanage and uh, that's how it all started and don't ask me how many rhinos are in the orphanage please <laughs> we don't like to give that type of information but it's dozens and dozens of them and a lot of rhinos have been through the orphanage and uh, yeah it was a it was a hectic it it, it still is it, it it is sometimes really heartbreaking because not all of them make it um but uh, it's the best thing we've ever done in our lives because it's absolutely unbelievable you know when they come in what we do is we rescue and we raise and rehabilitate and release baby rhinos whose mothers were shot due to the poaching pandemic. It's, COVID's not the only pandemic in Africa. Poaching is almost worse than that. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, when they come in, they are totally stressed. They are, I mean, you must realize they've just lost their mother. Some of them... Uh, some of these babies, uh, they took the rescue teams five to six days to find the calf, to find the baby. Um, so they are totally dehydrated. They sometimes got absolutely horrific injuries. Uh, we've had three that were shot as well that survived it. Um, and uh, they arrive at the orphanage in such a state it's terrible but when you get the message or from the girls because these only girls work there as carers a man can't do their job it's impossible you need the motherly instinct to kick in because when the new calf comes in they sometimes don't sleep for five days five days and five nights but you know you're a you're a lady you know how it works <laughs> you're much tougher than men a lot more tough and uh, yeah, and when you get that message that the little baby is drinking and it's relaxed and it's accepted, he's new mother, and it's the best feeling in the world. It's absolutely wonderful. So you, you get a call from somebody that there is a 
baby rhino that they have found or that they know is out there somewhere. So the first step is to go find the baby and rescue it and bring it to your facility. That's right. Do you uh, do that whole process? Do you all have um, a helicopter or do you go out in trucks with a team and uh, tranquilize no. them and bring them in? Or how do you do that? Uh, there's an organization in South Africa called Rhino 911. Uh, they do the flying. They do the, they got a helicopters and they look for it. There's, you, there's always a vet with them because the vet will have to dart the baby and tranquilize it. And then it all depends on the size and the age of the baby. If it's small enough, they load it into the helicopter. Uh, we usually meet the helicopter halfway somewhere. It just lands. We offload the baby. If it's small enough, we put it in the vehicle that we use. If it's too big, we use a um, trailer, specially made trailers. Uh, and uh, it is, it's very traumatic for the little babies. What we do, and sometimes people don't realize, and they you know, ask a lot of questions why we do it. We take away their senses. We blindfold them and we put earplugs. You can't take the smell away. They take the smell away, they can't taste. And that helps a lot to get them drinking. Our, our record was four minutes after pickup, it's, uh, baby started drinking, but the worst was five days. Uh, and once it starts drinking, but usually that was like, uh, total uh, oof, that baby was totally freaked out um, but usually within a few hours they drink so what we do is we first of all take the earplugs out because remember they now in, in an area and in a situation the smells is different the sounds are different everything is different and they're wild animals uh, a few hours ago, they were running around in the wild with their mother. Now the mother's dead. And uh, once they start drinking, what we do is while they're drinking, we take the blindfold off. Mm -hmm. And they get the fright of their lives because their mother's lost a lot of weight. All of a sudden, it looks totally different. But once it's hooked to the bottle, that's it. Okay, they still, in the beginning, they charged the girls. They black and blue, the poor creatures that worked there. Um, but they settled down. Uh, what we do is we've got lots of pods, different groups of rhinos of more or less the same age. And if you got a group of rhinos the same age of, as the baby that came in within a couple of days, you can link them up with the, the others, and that helps a lot to settle them down. That helps, really, really helps a lot. But as I've said, uh, we've seen horrific injuries that come in with, with rifle shots. Um, it's, it's, it's scary. Um, because they don't leave the mother's carcass. They stay with the mother. Mm -hmm. And they're in the way. And they get hacked with, with machetes and axes. We had a little girl that we picked up in a very big reserve in South Africa that had 21 X and panga or machete wounds in her face and on her head. There was one between the ears that when we cleaned that wound, when you opened the wound to clean it, you could see the brain. And the vet of this uh, particular reserve said to us when we went to fetch the baby, euthanize, she will never make it. Never, ever. And uh, she's a big girl of almost, oh, she's now over seven years old. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. No, uh, but not all of them make it. Not all of them make it. Some of them, uh, is uh, the injuries are so horrific. It's, you sometimes... Obviously, the vets make the call, and uh, if we have to, sometimes, but very, uh, it happens very seldom that they have to be euthanized. Right. So the, the some of them are paralyzed. Oh, really? When they come in, yeah, they get hacked. They they hit them on the on the spine, 
and then they break the spine and they cut, uh, then uh, there's nothing you can do. So these, just so people understand, these babies are completely 100% dependent on their mothers like a human child. Yes. And the only thing they're living off of at that point is their mother's milk. That's right. And Depending so, on their age. Right. And yeah, how... If they're under three, three months old, they, they drink milk only. Once they're over three months, they start eating a little bit of solids and they wean at around 18 months. Right. Okay. So that's pretty old. That's a year and a half. Hmm. Yeah. And so you go rescue them. The vet probably, I'm assuming they put an IV in immediately just to get them hydrated before they get to you. Yes. And yes. then you all try to get them on milk as soon as possible. Yes. And that's what the women caregivers are doing. Yes. Yeah. Now, do the, women, do the women caregivers stay with them 24 hours a day? Are they? Yes. They sleep with them. They never leave their side. Remember, maybe rhinos with the mother 24 hours a day. Right. They never leaves the side. So they're with them day and night. It's the, a tough, tough job. Is it the same team that works on each rhino, or do they rotate around so the rhinos don't get habituated to one particular? Uh, you you know, know, we do. What we do with a, a baby is usually. A new baby will have two, maximum three carers looking after it. So once it's introduced to other rhinos, the whole process of rehabilitation starts and you take the human contact away over a long, long time. It takes very long. Right. Uh, we only release when they're about four and a half to five years old. So, but then they rehabilitate. Then, because you have to test it. And if, if you drive up to them or walk up to them, they must run away. And once that happens, then you know it's time to start the release. Right. And we have released quite a few, and they're doing brilliant, brilliant. I mean, it's such an incredible gift that you're giving to the world to do this. And it's amazing that you have so many that you've taken care of which is fantastic, but it's so also horrific that this is still going on. It's still a necessity. Yeah, unfortunately, I've always said that the best day of my life will be the day when I stand around the rhino orphan and say, what the hell am I going to do with this place now? <laughs> then I know the poaching has stopped, but unfortunately, that's a long, long way off. Yeah. That's not going to happen very soon. Now, how do you get the people that come in as carers? Are they people in the local community? Are they people that you sort of um, wrangle from other parts of the world? How, how does that work? Uh, we have full-time uh, carers that work full-time on a full-time basis. Mm -hmm. And then we also get volunteers in. But the volunteers have to come in for a minimum of three months because you, you can't have this massive rotation of people and, you know, that's not what it's all about. It's, it's not, the facility is not open to the public. We can't, they can't have the stream of people the whole time. That's, that defeats the issue. Right. Um, the, the girls that work there, I always, I get, we get a lot of phone calls and we get a lot of emails every day of people wanting to work there because they think it's, wonderful what they see on tv and that's sort of what it's all about they have to shovel down and clean and do all kinds of things and they all ask and i get a lot of uh, inquiries from people saying what must i do what must i know what must i go and study to do this nothing i always say to them nothing all i want from you is passion i can teach you everything but i can't teach you passion and People that do not have the passion for animals and the absolute love for animals don't last it. They don't. They can't. It's impossible. So I've got a very, very good team, and they are really passionate, and they're really excellent. They, they love what they do. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the Rhino Orphanage uh, uh, logos. Uh, underneath it says, Nklu Yale Ratu. 
It's in Sutu, which is one of the indigenous languages of South Africa. And it translated, it means the house of love. Because mm. at the Rhino Orphanage, we believe that unconditional love heals all wounds, physical and psychological wounds. And that is why the orphanage is successful, because the people working there are really, really passionate. And they love what they do. And they give so much love to these animals that... You know, they are wonderful creatures. They are absolutely, you know, if you think of a rhino, it's a prehistoric monster. That is the biggest misconception in the world. Every single one has got a different personality. Every single one is, they are unbelievable animals. They're super intelligent. They're super intelligent. They can open any gate, any door, any, you, you try and see. You have to keep changing the type of locks because they figure it out. And, uh, and they go and walk about. <laughs> but uh, yes, it, it, in the beginning, when a little baby comes in, it is horrific. It is, those girls are dead on their feet because uh, they, they're with that baby the whole time. And like I said to you, they don't sleep for days on end. But uh, the satisfaction that you get when that baby accepts you is you something money can never buy it's mm -hmm. it's it's unbelievable so great it's really incredible well tell tell me how like a a typical day would go if like you weren't doing a rescue how would a typical day go for um one of your more newly acquired rhino babies a typical day for a new baby, a baby that is still drinking, well, obviously, a baby that's still drinking milk. Um, what they, all depending on, on, on their age, uh, the younger they are, the more frequent they uh, get milk. They get, uh, they start off about every two hours, and that's right through the night. It's 24 hours, wow. so they get 12 feeds a day. Wow. Um, then it goes out to three hours, three hourly and so forth and so forth. So they, they get taken out. The babies that is in the orphanage itself, that sleeps in the air conditioning. Remember, they sleep on mattresses. Okay. And they, their rooms, their overnight rooms have got air conditioning and heating and everything. They, I mean, it's a five-star hotel, but they, they deserve that. And uh, they will, they get taken out on walks. They, they walk with them, the girls walk with them in the bush uh, to help them to get to know the bush and to be rhinos. And uh, so for a baby, it, it's twice a day walks, a lot of milk, a lot of uh, dry food that they get fed, special dry food. And what babies do, they sleep a lot. So... <laughs> They sleep, they sleep a lot, but uh, for a baby, it, it, it's, it's, that come, that came out of that trauma and out of that absolute horrific things that happened to it and to its mother, uh, they live a happy life. And you can actually see it. I don't know if you've seen the videos of the Rhino Orphanage, where they bounce around and run and have fun and, and they just love life. And that is what's so nice about it. They just love life. For the girls, a typical day is hard work, cleaning, making milk, picking up rhino dung, uh, taking babies out on walks. But it's, it's, it's wonderful. They love it. That's why they do it. We do a lot of uh, academic research is done at the Rhino Orphanage as well, which is very important. Very little research was ever done on rhinos. So we've had a few that uh, we had a, a lady that did her PhD in veterinary science on certain, that was the first pharmacological research ever done on rhinos uh, to see how antibiotics and painkillers work inside in, in rhinos and it was actually she her thesis uh, went viral all over the world uh, it's actually totally different than what everybody expected wow. because remember people are really they always want to compare rhinos with horses 
because they both hung gut fermenters. They have basically the same, more or less the same anatomy, anatomy and physiology, but it was, and they compared it with horses and everything is just the opposite, oh. you know, where a uh, certain painkiller will work very quick in horses. It doesn't work in rhinos and vice versa and all this so it is it, it's it's difficult and they're doing a lot of real we've had a lot of postdoc students coming mm -hmm. in postdoctoral students coming in on not only veterinary uh, issues and veterinary uh, but also on, on behavioral science uh, people doing research on, on, on how they behave and how they behave before release, after release, we've got a girl that follows the rhinos that were released day and every day of her life. That's all she does um, and monitors them and, 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 and document their behavior and how they adapt to the wild rhinos that was in this area and etc. So it, it, it's a big story. We actually on the at the moment tomorrow we are going to do an artificial insemination on two of the young, not, well, they're not young, they're now sexually mature rhinos because you must remember they grow up with the males. Right. And it, it, it's this thing of we all equal. You don't have that dominant, dominant male, you know, the one, the, the alpha male, because uh, they see them as brothers. Right. So, uh, and the brother and the male will see the other rhinos, basically. Obviously, when when they're old enough and big enough and old enough, and they can stand their own against other bulls, then it will be different. So, uh, we we holding thumbs. If it's successful, it'll be the first in the world. Wow. Ooh, uh, yeah, but it's done. What we 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 actually very lucky. We have access to some of the best vets. In the world, uh, we've got the Rhino Whisperer. Uh, we've got yeah, he, we've got brilliant Rhino vets, absolutely brilliant, brilliant Rhino vets, and that helps a lot. It really helps a lot. That uh, are very passionate about Rhinos and passionate about what they do, and uh, yeah, so we. Touch wood, we are, we have a very, very, very low mortality rate. Touch wood, I can't remember when last we lost the baby. Uh, so, yeah. So it, we are quite successful. We are successful, but success comes from a lot of things, but the main ingredient for success, working with animals or passion and love for the animals. And do you have a lot of, uh, are there other people that are following your model? Uh, yes, we, there's now, I think there's seven rhino orphanage and such, orphanages in South Africa at the moment. We were the first. Uh, so there's a, quite a few now, and uh, which is wonderful because we can't take it. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. So we, you have, there's two of them close to Kruger National Park. We used to drive to Kruger National Park to go and pick up babies really? and there and back and the loading and everything was sometimes 15 hour trips and time is everything when it comes to those babies. The quicker you can get them to the orphanage, the quicker, you know, it helps a lot. It really does. Yeah. So uh, there is quite a few orphanages now. There's in KwaZulu Natal, there's one, there's one in Northern Cape, there's one in Western Cape. Uh, so that helps a lot. Yeah, no, it helps a lot. So when they all work together. Yes, that's amazing. Uh, that's crucial, I think. Um, so when these rhinos are reintroduced to the wild, are they reintroduced on your property or are they taken back to where they originated? Um, some of the rhinos go back to where they come from. Mm -hmm. Usually, if they were privately owned, they uh, mm -hmm. go back to where they come from. Right. Uh, a lot of our rhinos come from government parks mm -hmm. in South Africa, and it, up to now, they, they they don't want them back. I don't think they can look after you. 
Oh, really? So then what happens? Yeah. They end up on so your we re So what we do, we release a lot of them on uh, a, a reserve, our reserve, more or less, that is it's enormous. It's big. So oh, they, God. yeah, and there's resident wild rhinos on the reserve. So and that's so important to see the babies, the orphans, their reaction. Because uh, some of them have been on that reserve now for over a year and they have made friends and buddies and they've changed all the structures on the reserve. And yeah, it's it's wonderful. They've linked up with all the wild rhinos and yeah, that's, that's, they're wild now. They're proper rhino. That's so fantastic. So that, that kind of um, reminds me of a question that I had and that is, what is the rhino's importance to its ecosystem? What is it contributing to the ecosystem that if we didn't have the rhinos would make a big difference? Uh, we've lost so many species on this planet that the ecosystem is stuffed <laughs> because of that. It's, for me, the rhino is just such an iconic species. It's part of the big five. It actually is a, uh, it's an ancient species. Mm -hmm. And uh, Africa can never, ever be the same without them. How can you, how can I invite you to come to South Africa to look at the big four? We can't do that. Tell us what the big five is for people that don't know. The big five are elephant, rhino, Okay, buffalo, leopard, and lion. Uh, the big five actually originated from, it's a, a hunting thing. Oh. You know, the hunters talk about the big five, the dangerous animals. Okay. You know, we're not in, in, into that, yeah. but it's still in South Africa. We love our ecotourism. We love to welcome people from all over the world to show them to look at the big five. You know, it is actually such a sad state of affairs at the moment in South Africa that a lot of people have started dehorning the rhino yes. to try and reduce the risk of poaching. And certain, a certain very big government reserve had um, dehorned all their rhino. And uh, they've now had two incidents to, uh, that Lions attacked the babies. Baby, the baby rhinos had to be treated by vets for horrific injuries by lions. And why does that happen? Because it, it never happens because the mother can't defend her baby. Wow. She doesn't have the weapon anymore. She doesn't have a horn. So it is this sketch 22 situation that yeah. people sit in. I mean, how do you do it? Do you save? I actually had a discussion today with people and said, God, because I just uh, ordered some bulletproof vests for our uh, tracker dogs. Um, so they <laughs> And I thought, this is, I wonder why can't we just make bulletproof vests for rhinos, but it, it won't help, it won't work. You can't put a thing like that on a wild animal. Yeah. But uh, it, it's just, man's greed is yeah. terrible. I mean, everything, this whole situation is all about money and greed. Because rhino horn, you know, is it's worthless. It's nothing. It's this it's skeleton. It's made of the same substance as your hair or your nails. It's protein. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's, but it's part of Chinese traditional medicine. So that makes, makes it very sought after. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the um, methods that I heard about a long time ago, I don't know if they still do it, but they were, putting some kind of dye into the rhino horns does that what does that do does that is that a they, 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 they try to put poison in as well it can penetrate if i can use the term it, that that uh, dye and it was mixed with insecticide and all mm. kinds of oh, yeah to put in there can penetrate a dead horn but not a live one okay 
In other words, they tried it on horns that were cut off, uh, you know, that was, so it, it is, the live horn is like perspex inside. There's no way you, uh, that, that it can't penetrate. So it, it doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work. Financial burden is security. Yes. Yes. We have to have a small army to look after them. Yeah. Do you have um, like 24 hour um, guards that walk around yes. with the rhinos? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And are, do they have to keep their identity secret so that they are not uh, approached when they're outside yeah. of the reserve? Yes. They have to, yeah. Uh, no, that's very important because you know what? It, 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 it's, it's Africa. Africa's third world. South Africa is also a third world country. For information only, just to say to the poaching gangs or the poaching, remember, it's, it's organized crime. It's run by organized crime. So the poaching syndicates are run by organized crime. And just to give information, to a poaching syndicate to say, yes, on that farm there's rhinos. They get more money mm -hmm. that they make in a year. Yeah. The shooter makes more money that he can ever earn in 10 years. Time. So that is the problem. You're fighting organized crime. You're fighting. It's like fighting a drug cartel. Yes. There's yeah. just too much money involved. It, it's such a problem and, and like you said the identity if people if they know this guy is anti poaching guard mm -hmm. they'll pay him anything for information anything right. and i'm telling you now 90 percent plus of all the poaching in south africa is inside information really yes yes so how do you see a solution to this do you see is there any hope at all to get this under control Whew. Yeah, there's a lot of theories. You can re-educate a third of the world's population. I don't know how long that's going to take you. You need support from everywhere and everybody. I've always said not a single person, a single organization, or even a single country can solve this problem. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, we do not have the 100% commitment of government. And that's where it should start. I mean, I once had a discussion with, with, with a gentleman from Australia and he said to me, he looked at me and he said to me, you know, if this happened in Australia, it would be over in two weeks time. I said, how the hell do you think you're going to do that? And he said, because the Australian people will stand up and say to the government, stop it or we'll kick you out and vote a new one in. But Africa works different. It works totally different. So that is that is a problem that we don't have 100% commitment from government. Um, and the whole thing, it's, there's just too much money involved. Too much money involved. I mean, how many people have tried to stop the drug trade in the world? It doesn't work. It doesn't help. Okay. Tell, me, tell me a little bit about the dogs that you use. Because it sounds like they're yes. very, a very important part of this whole Oh, yes, they are. We uh, got them yeah, donated. Uh, they Belgian Malinois or Belgian Shepherds. They are unbelievable animals. They are they the most intelligent and fearless dogs I've ever worked with in my life. Wow. They are unbelievable. They, a lot of, they, they are used in America all over by the police forces and security. They actually work in the White House. Belgian Melanoids. Oh, really? Um, so we got them. Their father uh, works in Kruger as, as an anti-poaching dog. So they're still very young. They're just over a year old. So they're still being trained, the two of them. they uh, The one is absolutely excellent in tracking the rhinos because the babies go on walks with the girls and they get naughty and they run off. And then it's sometimes very difficult to find them. And then they bring Hunter in and he tracks them and finds them quickly, quickly. He's, he's unbelievably well. He does unbelievably well. The other one, the bigger brother, is more of the attack dog. He's the, he's fearsome. <laughs> but he, 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 he's a lovely 
dog because they like pets at the Rhino Orphanage. I mean, they sleep in the girls' rooms, and I think, I don't know, but I think they sleep on the beds as well. It doesn't matter. I don't care. Um, so they will, they are telling you if the wrong person goes into the Rhino Orphanage with those two dogs there, I don't want to be, I don't want to be there. Yeah. They'll rip them, to, they'll rip them apart. They'll, yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll kill it. They will. So, uh, yeah, they're very, very important. They are now, when they're 18 months old, they're going to be trained. Uh, their tracking training is almost over now and done with, and they will train to attack on command. But oh. Oh. a good dog don't need a command. Right. He reads your body language. Right. He sees there's problems. He can feel it. He'll, he'll go for it. He'll attack so, yeah, no, they are very special dogs, very, very special. Uh, and how so do you We were very lucky to get them. How do, you, how do you get them to track a specific rhino? Do you have to give them something that smells like that particular? Something they smell, yeah, just to smell. You take, you, or you show them the track. Oh, okay. Of that specific rhino, smells the track, and then you'll go. Yeah, yeah. And they run on that track. They, they, it's unbelievable. They, yeah. Remember, their smell is... It's a couple of thousand times better than ours. Yeah. They unbelievable. But they these dogs are they they love to work and they absolutely love it. They love it. Because they've got a special harness. If they go out to work, they we put on the special harness. Right. The minute we put that on, their whole attitude changes. Right. You know? Because they're on the job. They become the soldier, you know, I'm this warrior. Uh, it, the girls take them out for for casual walks as well, yeah. but then only on the, with the collar and the, and then they're totally different. But the minute you put that harness on, boom, then the military kicks in, and uh, yeah, no, but they're wonderful. They they they. Uh, you must remember, we not only have to look after the rhinos at the orphanage, but we also have to look after the staff that's there. Right. Have you had poachers actually on your property? Nope. No, no, not yet. Thank God. No. Yes. Yeah. No, they. It, it, it's. It's. It's not going to be that easy because we've got external and internal anti-poaching uh, teams yeah. working. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. The orphanage itself, and then around it as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the only way to do it. It is an expensive, really expensive, expensive uh, hobby. Is to to establish a small army. Yeah. You have to do it. So, yeah. So how do you get your funding? Is it totally, uh, I guess it's all donation based, but you do you have um, some yes. companies that are supporting you as well? And We have corporate support, yes. Uh, obviously donations. We don't get any, any funding from government or any government park or anything. We don't charge anything mm -hmm. to look after the rhinos, not even private owners. We don't charge them. Because well, I had phone calls in the beginning and they would, they would phone me and say, listen, I've got a baby orphan, baby rhino. What is the rate? What do you charge to raise it? And we, you would give them a figure and they would say, no, then I'll rather shoot. Right. So I decided we don't charge. Nothing. We do everything for free. Everything. Do you find that anybody ever offers to to donate money to help with the rehabilitation of an animal that's come off of their property, like even Kruger National Park? No. No, they never. No, do. not for government parks. No, nothing. Um, some of the uh, private owners might, but not really. There's good people out there. We get a lot of donations from all over the world. Um, and we get a lot of corporate support as well. We get corporate support. We get, uh, you know, uh, the world's a funny place. Things happen very, in this very strange ways that uh, you get these phone calls and all of a sudden things start falling out of the sky. Uh, like we, when we started the orphanage, I contacted every motoring manufacturer in South Africa. I said, please, can you help us with vehicles? And I, nothing. No. There was only one that I never spoke to. 
was sick, you know, they were. And I, about a little more than a year ago, I got a phone call from this lady and said, uh, hello, are you so-and-so? I said, yes. And she said, I am so-and-so. I am from BMW, South Africa. Can you come and visit us? To cut a long story short, they sponsor us with vehicles. Unbelievable vehicles that you, uh, it's, 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 it, you can't believe it. So it is out there. The corporates are there and they, they are, okay, obviously. And everybody always says, you know, with the COVID things, how did you survive? Mm -hmm. We actually did quite well during COVID. Mm -hmm. Well, COVID's still going on, yeah. So we 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 can't complain. Uh, we're surviving. We're surviving. Obviously, we had a, a crisis when COVID started. When the first lockdown in South Africa started, we had to all our overseas volunteers had to go back. Oh. We had forty-eight oh. hours to get them back home. Ooh. So yeah, and then we had to called in South African volunteers because I usually we, we never used South African volunteers they too close to home because mm -hmm. if it gets a little bit difficult they can run home but now we got South African volunteers in and the one started in March and she's still there she doesn't want to leave but it's wonderful so yeah uh, obviously when the ports are totally open and that South Africa says the, the, the borders are open but we're not. There's 57 countries that are allowed to come into South Africa. So, yeah, once everything is over and done with, then uh, obviously we'll go back to overseas volunteers. But I must say the South African ones that's helped us out during this COVID pandemic and crisis uh, was absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. Well, how about the poaching? Did that slow down with the COVID? You know what happened was that uh, people said that it will escalate mm -hmm. because the people now have time to do whatever they have to do, the, the poachers. But it, it didn't really happen. And there's quite a few reasons for that. I mean, on, on the reserve across the road where we release all our babies, the game guides, the People that take the, used to take the guests out on game drive, uh, now there were no guests. They did security and they did anti-poaching. And especially in the big, big government reserves in South Africa, where you can go in with your private vehicle, mm -hmm. all of a sudden there was nothing. So if a vehicle was driving around, you knew it, it's, it's, it's a problem. So that actually helped a lot. And, 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 and we we received three babies during the COVID pandemic. That's all, and uh, so I think it it's going to start escalating now again. Now that the parks are open and private vehicles can go in, and the control is now all of a sudden strict anymore. Well, I do hope in this time, you know, I feel like COVID has put a sort of a lockdown on everybody's activity. And because of that, people are looking for new things to learn about. They have some quiet time to think about what else is going on in the world, to think about something other than themselves, to mm. really consider. I think it's brought real attention to what is happening in, uh, in the world at large on a global level. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this series was because I feel like people are sort of reevaluating the human involvement in the planet and what we've done so far and what we need to do going forward, what we need to change, what we need to make better. And I'm hoping that this is a time when people will get more involved in issues like this that are so important to keeping us, to keeping everything viable on, on the planet. I think this pandemic, okay, it's not an wasn't a very nice occurrence what happened a lot of people lost their lives uh, but it's changed the way people think because as you said people were thinking about themselves their own jobs their money and etc cetera, etc cetera. and all of a sudden everybody was equal your millions in the bank didn't help you not to get COVID or so the virus is not a snob. 
it, it attacks anyone. And, and, and for me, the greatest thing that happened was that the planet started healing. It was unbelievable. I mean, the water in Venice for the first time in how many years they could see the bottom. In South Africa, we saw things that we never saw. I mean, because I had permits to drive around when we had the hard, hard lockdown. Nobody was allowed outside. You couldn't go anywhere. But I had permits because obviously you can't say to a dying baby, sorry, it's, it's COVID-19 lockdown. But uh, then we used to drive on roads that was usually packed with vehicles. And all of a sudden there was wildlife. Yeah. Walking in the roads. And it, 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 the planet started healing. The planet started breathing again. It's actually a pity that we can't live in a hard lockdown for a couple of years. Can you imagine what the world will look like? That is one thing that was amazing. And the other is that it really did change the way people think. And they appreciate things more. Because they realize that Life is about a lot more than jobs and money and fast cars and entertainment and bright lights. Uh, and I, you're absolutely right that people are more involved in what really meant to heal the earth. Because we are, we are destroying this planet like you mean, at a rate that it's, it's scary. It's very scary, but I do believe that we can turn it around. I have, oh, yes. hope. I have hope and people like you are doing work that is phenomenal. And I think everybody should be aware of. Yes, awareness is, 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 is really important. There's a lot of TV shows made on the Rhino Orphanage, and that really helped. It really helps a lot because people, people, a lot of people, even in South Africa, that you know we've got the wildlife in abundance, uh, don't really know what's going on because they don't care. It's now all of a sudden they start realizing. But there are animals that is in absolute dire, dire need of help. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it does change the way people think. You will never change certain people. Certain people can't think. They don't think they are too selfish, greedy to uh, worry about four-legged creatures. So uh, they won't. But mo a lot, it, it changes people's point of view on the way they look at things, the way they look at nature. And that helps a lot. That really does. Because as, but as I said, we need, a lot of people need to pull together to save this planet and save the species like the rhinos. One or two people or a couple of organizations can't do it. We can't. Yeah. yeah. Well, I agree that it's educating them, making people aware, because if you don't know what's happening, you don't know that there's something you can do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Uh, and I also am very keen on people recognizing that uh, these are sentient, intelligent beings that are just as valuable as we are. And, and more valuable. <laughs> more valuable. They're more aware. They're more conscious. They have a much clearer understanding of what's going on in the world. We're completely disconnected from everything. Everything. And we have a lot totally. to learn from them. So we need to get reconnected and take ourselves down a notch to recognize that, you know, this is an important thing that we need to be doing. You know, I think we're going to turn things around, but I think the word has got to get out. And so I so appreciate your talking to me. No, it's a great pleasure. And thank you for, thank you for talking to me and to us and, 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 and carrying out the message and, trying to help and make people aware that there's it's not only because you know in the beginning of the poaching pandemic in South Africa when they, the poaching started escalating if you read in the newspapers so many rhinos were shot you saw it on TV so many rhinos were shot but nobody ever 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 said anything about the calves nobody knew anything about the calves the calves died in nature yeah. of dehydration or were eaten by lions or whatever and all of a sudden, once, once this thing started, it, people started realizing, oh my gosh, yeah, 
But what if a mother with a calf is shot? What happens to the calf? Right. And now there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people all over the world that actually care about. And that, that helps. That helps. Absolutely. Every little bit helps, I think. Is there anything in that, that um, people listening to this can do to help? With you, or- uh, yes, obviously, obviously they can, they can go on on our uh, website. Better will be to go on our Facebook page, the okay. Rhino Orphanage Facebook page. They can see the little babies or Instagram. And, okay, um, we'll post so, that. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to donate, and they can adopt babies. Yeah, and 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 just spread the word because it is. Unfortunately, as I said, a very, very expensive hobby. Yeah. Really expensive hobby. I can imagine. So, yeah. yes. Okay. Well, we will put your what, your website, your Facebook page, your Instagram. We'll put all that at the end of the video so people can. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll get the word out. I have so enjoyed connecting with you and I will. Thank you following your work and when this pandemic is running down um i'd love to connect again and um do that please see how you're doing and it's been a real pleasure pleasure is all mine thank you all right bye-bye all right thank you bye-bye